Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, a little change of pace, we're gonna do some gunsmithing. So as I've gotten older, it's gotten progressively more difficult for me to see my front sights well. And so uh, a red dot optic is really ideally suited for people in my situation who can't see their front sights but can still see distant uh, objects pretty well. So uh, a red dot optic allows you to sort of look through a little window, see a little red dot, and you just track that dot over whatever it is that you're shooting, and you use that as your point of aim rather than lining up your iron sights. So typically red dot optics are mounted directly on top of the slide and probably the ideal way of doing this is to machine a little flat into the slide itself. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now I recognize most people don't have CNC machines. So I'm going to try to orient this video so that if you're thinking about having a slide milled for a red dot, this will give you some useful information about how it works and some of the pros and cons of doing it different ways. I'm personally going to be installing a Burris Fast Fire 3, but actually a lot of the specific dimensions of this particular mount also apply to Vortex's shields and a couple of other red dot brands. Even if you're thinking about a Trigicon, which mount in a slightly different way, this still might help you with your evaluation. So let's talk about mounting. First, theory. In the grand scheme of things, a perfect optic would look straight down the bore of the gun. The further your sighting plane diverges from the initial trajectory of your bullet, the more jujitsu you have to do to know where your bullet's actually going to hit. Conventional iron sights are basically as close to the bore as you can get. Anything with glass is going to end up further from the bore. Just to mention one problem, if I'm shooting over a car or around a barricade, and those are pretty common in the kind of competition shooting that I do, I may think that I have clearance around that object based on the sight plane that I'm observing, but actually the bullet is flying out of the front of the gun lower. That bullet may then strike the barricade or glance off the roof of the car, whatever. And this is not only potentially dangerous and spoils your shot, but it also gets you disqualified from competition. All of which means that the further you can drive the mount of your red dot down into your frame, the truer your sight picture. Additionally, if you've spent many, many years indexing your pistol to a particular proprioceptive location, the more change you make to a new sight picture, the harder it's going to be to adjust your gun to that new hold point. Obviously, a little practice will get you there, but it's just something to consider. So there are a wide range of ways that you can mount an optic to a pistol. Some of them involve mounting plates and Picatinny rails and things like that, and all of those are going to lift that optic up a little bit. In the grand scheme of things, you're better off, as a general rule, mounting directly to the slide than hanging a bunch of adapters and Picatinny rails and all that stuff that'll lift the optic further away from the bore. So let's look at the optic itself. It mounts with two number 648 screws that go through two holes on the top of the optic. But that's not the whole story. On the bottom, it has four little holes. These are intended to mate with four bosses or studs on the mounting plate. They'll keep the optic rigidly located so that your mounting screws don't absorb any recoil and therefore the optic can't twist and lose point of aim or even worst case scenario, shear off those screws. So in addition to milling out this little slot or channel or pocket, whatever you want to call it, that reaches down into the slide, along with two drilled and tapped holes, I'll also want to mill these little bosses or projections or studs, whatever you want to call those, that stick up. Now, this is great and all, but there's one problem. If I decide that red dots are great, but that this Burris sucks, I could have to junk this slide or do some additional machining to mount another optic. On the flip side, many other sites do mount onto this configuration, so if I switch to, say, a Vortex, I'm cool. Anyway, let's turn to the Glock slide and see what kind of real estate we're dealing with. Here I'm actually looking at a Glock 19, but the distances on the rear part are the same as they are on my 34. So basically, we need to put the optic somewhere back here, which is all well and good, but there are a bunch of complications. 
Most of them come out of this fact. The Glock has a drop safety plunger, which is situated here, and runs up into a hole that's drilled through the slide. So if we mill out a pocket up on top, we can potentially cut into that hole and that will cause the drop safety not to work, which can create unsafe conditions or potentially make it so that you can't fire your pistol at all. Either way, not good. So you can get around that by milling the slot further back. Now the issue with that is that then you have to mill out the dovetail for your rear sight and that's the end of your present iron sights. Now I want to keep my iron sights on both as a potential co-witness or in case I figure out that I just hate red dots, I can take it off and go back to irons. So my solution is to mill a fairly shallow little channel about 50 thousandths of an inch deep. Now this will cut a tiny, tiny bit off of the hole that the spring goes into for the drop safety plunger, but it won't affect the travel of the plunger itself, which is what will cause your gun to stop functioning. Another little complication, the front and rear of the red dot are curved, so I have to figure out what I want to do with that. All right, let's jump over to my CAD program, Fusion 360, and look what I came up with. So I'm just modeling my slide as a rectangular bar. I'll be cutting down, as I said, 50 thousandths of an inch or about a millimeter and a half. That amount isn't critical other than, as I noted earlier, I don't want to break down into that drop safety plunger hole. I just need enough to raise sturdy bosses or studs that will keep the optic from moving around. The holes for the mounting screws aren't shown to scale, but they're four millimeters deep. That's enough to admit the entire screw that is shipped with the burris, but it won't cut into any of the cavities in the slide for the firing pin and so forth. The only tricky thing from a design standpoint was how to handle the fact that the optic is radius on the front and the back. And it worked out to be an arc with a radius of 50 millimeters. So I just radius the front edge of my cavity to fit the burris perfectly. I would have done the same on the rear, but the clearance between the rear studs and the wall of the pocket with that radius on it would have had to have been about 30 thousandths of an inch or well under a millimeter. Which means in turn that I would have had to use a minute little end mill. Now this can be done, but tiny end mills break ridiculously easily, so I decided to just ditch the rear radius and only radius the front. This radius thing is just kind of gilding the lily anyway, so nothing to worry about. Alright, so let's go make some chips. I'll rough out most of the slide dry on my Tormach 770 using an adaptive clearing path with a four flute quarter inch titanium aluminum nitride coated carbide end mill. I've always heard that Glock put some kind of really hard finish on their slides, so I Rockwell tested it. If the finish is really hard, it turns out it's not deep at all. So the slide came in at about 35 on the Rockwell C scale. So compared to what I'm used to machining, this is pretty much like butter. For you machining geeks, I kept all the feeds and speeds really, really conservative. If I were doing this on a production basis, I'd run everything harder and wrap it a lot faster and whatnot, but my main goal here was just to get through this without smashing a tool. After that, I'll turn to an eighth inch end mill. Kind of dull, but it worked fine. I'm doing a rest milling operation here, meaning that I'm just clearing out the material that's left by the larger end mill. Finally, another rest milling operation with a 1 16th inch end mill, which is getting pretty darn small. I'm running mist coolant on this one because it's uncoated carbide. The 1 16th also puts final contours on all the axial surfaces, that's the vertical surfaces. Then I'll chamfer all the corners that I can get to without crunching anything up. Now I'll drill the holes for the mounting screws. I'm spot drilling first. If you don't, especially with a skinny little drill like I'm using here, you can end up with these mounting holes wandering off to who knows where. And then you're heading over to slide mark for another slide. I'm using a number 32 drill for the actual holes themselves.
and that's that. Before taking it off, I check to make sure that the thing actually fits. Perfect. Really nice slip fit, which is exactly what I wanted so it doesn't move around during recoil. I'll be threading the mounting screws by hand. I could do them on the CNC, but it would be a little risky with really shallow holes like these. As I said, they had to be just barely longer than the mounting screws so as to avoid blasting into these cavities that run through the interior of the slide. That means that they'll need to be tapped with a bottoming tap to get those threads way deep into the hole. Bottoming taps, if you don't do everything just perfectly, are real easy to snap off, so I figured it would be quicker and easier to do it by hand. I'm using a plug tap to get the first couple of threads established, then I'll use a bottoming tap to finish them off. A bottoming tap is a tap that runs the threads almost all the way to the bottom of the hole. It puts a lot more stress on the tap to run them that way, and as a result, you have to be pretty careful about them. But anyway, I put it in my drill with the clutch set just super low so that I wouldn't snap the tap. And I test it out to see if the threads went deep enough. Yeah, boy. And all it's left to do is to lock tight it in, then head over to the range to get it sighted in correctly. So one of the cool things about knife making is that a lot of the skills that you learn in making knives are transferable to other things. So I'm a big believer that if you really want to push your skills as a knife maker, it helps you to get outside of your comfortable realm of doing whatever it is that you typically do, whether it's forging or uh, stock removal, folders, fixed blades, whatever it might be and you know just challenge yourself to do something a little bit different i'm not a gunsmith by any stretch of the imagination but uh you know by sort of challenging myself to take on a task that i don't really know too much about uh, i learned something myself so i hope you guys did too uh see you soon and uh, next time we'll be back with more knife making thanks for watching guys if you feel like you got something out of this video don't forget to subscribe also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!